Rule number one, don't open the door. I need a little more up top and a little less down below. Amber alert. Oh God, something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen. In orbit of Uranus. It smells. I don't even want to talk about it. Oh no, you love me, you know you love me. Just don't let it touch the, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> You know, that's great, but give me a little more. <laughs> why, why are you shooting at me? <laughs> You can't start the car. Johnny has the keys. Hey, hello, and welcome out there in podcast and YouTube land. You have reached Johnny Has the Keys, a podcast and subsequent YouTube channel where two guys get together and we talk about horror, science fiction, films, literature, television, key influences on the particular topic of the week, and then things that that then in turn influenced after that, um, hopefully, sometimes, when we can think of them. Uh, we've been doing this for a while now. If you're joining us for the first time, wow, thank you so much. We're glad to have you with us. And we would appreciate it if maybe you just do your typical thing like there by subscribing, giving us a review, maybe going to Apple and giving us a review. That always helps us find more people. Um, thumbs up, all that kind of good stuff. And if you're joining us again, of course, thank you for coming back. Um, if you are new to us, um, we are an unscripted podcast, which means we don't even know what we're going to talk about uh, as far as details or points go until it happens. And a lot of it comes from um, you guys uh, telling us what movies you want to see, what things you're thinking about, and all of that. Uh, and we also have a website, of course, and some a Patreon and all that. And we'll talk about that at the end. But um, my name is David. I'm joined here by my uh, co-partner in crime, Tim. Tim, how are you? What have you been doing this week? Oh, man. I um, Well, I've been doing a lot, actually. Uh, my, my viewing and reading has expanded immensely here lately. Um, I think I've mentioned to you that I'm, I'm back in the Dark Tower saga, so mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been reading mm -hmm. that. But um, speaking of Stephen King this week, uh, I actually went back and watched, uh, th this was not this week because I talked to you about it earlier, but here recently I went back and watched something I had not seen because I recently got Paramount Plus, and that mm -hmm. is the miniseries of The Stand. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh one of my favorite Stephen King novels. Yes. Uh, I'm a fan of the original miniseries from the 90s, and I wanted to see what this take was going to be like because it didn't get really good word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed it. I would. It gets less review, less good reviews than the original series. I would put them about equal. Because okay. both have strengths and both have weaknesses. Uh, this one is more modern. It has more modern effects. Uh, some of the cast is better. In particular, the guy that plays Randall Flagg is the Skarsgård, the older Skarsgård boy. Is it William? Yeah. I think it's William. I can't remember. Uh, I think he's better than Jamie Sheridan as Randall Flagg. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you that don't know, this is an apocalyptic movie. It, uh, basically, a super flu wipes out the population of the United States, and then it kind of turns into a sequel to the Bible where it's a good versus evil kind of thing. And the evil It was a perfect West. book to read during the pandemic. You know? Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> um, James Marsden plays Stu in this. I think. Think I don't think he's quite as good as Gary Sinise was. So it's like if I could pick and choose the cast. Uh, Ray Walston played Glenn Bateman in the original 90s miniseries. However, Greg Kinnear plays him in this, and I think Greg Kinnear is much better as Glenn mm. Bateman. In okay. This. Um, not really much else to say about it because it's been around for a few years now. Actually, it's, this series has only been around for three years, but the book itself came out in the late seventies. And of course the original series came out in the nineties. Um, the nineties one was three parts. Wasn't it? Wasn't it a three night deal? It was like six hours or eight hours, something like that. It um, may have been four. Like maybe four, eight yeah, four hours. nights and eight hours, something like that. Uh, I just remembered that I did like the st 
structure a lot of the 90s one uh, mm -hmm. because it was similar to the book and the fact that it kept flipping back and forth and back and forth um, between all these characters at first, but then also near the last half, it's, of course, all these characters in Vegas and what's happening right. in Vegas and going back and forth. Um, uh, yeah. Did, did th was this similar? Uh, this? It was similar. There are some big differences, though. Um, one of the differences and one of the reasons people may be interested in this one, including myself, is that the entire last episode is like a caveat that was written by Stephen King for this production. So it's all new material. Really? Yeah. So there's okay. an, an entire episode that is like an epilogue where Stu and, and, or Stu and Fran go back east. And so it's after Vegas. It's after everything has happened. Yes. Huh. And everything has settled down. The town loves them. They're real reluctant to go, but they decide they want to go back to the East Coast and they leave. And there's a little bit. Of sh it's kind of like a little short story of them going back east. And Stephen mm. King wrote it specifically for this production. So that alone is incentive for me of, to watch it. I would think it would be incentive for others to watch this version. Of for course, sure. especially King fans. Now, now I mm -hmm. want to watch it. Yeah, so, and, and it's on Paramount Plus. You said it's on Paramount Plus. Uh, I can't remember how many episodes it was. Uh, it seems like it was a little bit longer than the original. Mm -hmm. And the kid they've got playing Harold Lauder is also fantastic. Hmm. Okay. So there's there's like several actors in this version that stand out. So I would okay. highly recommend it for that as well. Um, so for you folks out there. That's what I did this genre week. I watched The Stand. Wow. Well, I guess because my uh, mood was into a mix of horror and science fiction and especially um, how those two play together, I decided to finally watch something that's been on my list forever that you actually beat me to and watched before me, oh. um, which was a, um, a little horror thing called Nope, uh, which was is is by our uh one of our favorite new you know um um horror director i guess producer director writer you know whatever uh sort of thing who also did the new reboot of the twilight zone um which is our um um and and i why did i forget his name is jordan peel jordan um, peel and i just threw an image up there oh well i thought i had no there it is i threw an image up there for you <laughs> Uh, it basically <laughs> well, uh, nope. It basically is uh, Daniel Kalula, Kaluya, uh, mm -hmm. Kiki Palmer, and Brandon Peria. Um, you had saw, seen you saw this before me. I actually saw this recently too. That's why okay. I had images for it because I was going to use it. But since you're talking about it, let's talk about it. <laughs> let's talk about it. Um, this was a really interesting movie. Um, <laughs> it's different. It is it's very different. And it's it's different in pacing. It's different in, I guess, thematic content almost to a point. I mean, there are parts of it where I'm going, is is he wanting to do a comedy, but it's not a comedy, or what? It was very strange, especially the last like forty five minutes. I thought. Um, I thought. I what, what, what you wanted to say? Something. Okay. Well, no, I was just going to say it, it, it is a little more sci fi than his others, even though there is a, t t a little bit of sci fi in Get Out. So it, it's, it's kind of a departure there, you know? Right. You, but the it, horror is what he does best. And that's what works best in this. Mm -hmm. The horror actually does work best. The sci fi, not so much. A little bit. Yeah, maybe. But it was like, um, <sighs> I don't know. It really hit me different. And I was thinking, should I go watch it again? Because it wasn't that I didn't like it, but it wasn't that I loved it either. It was one of uh, those. If, if, if I had to rank Jordan Peele movies, it would be the last for me as far as Agreed. I, I, the other movies he's done. I like better. I don't dislike it, though. I think it's very original and, and something that we don't see enough of these days. And he pays homage to a lot of great classic sci-fi invasion type movies yes um, including yeah, there's lots of we we would have a ball when we do this one eventually for keys and everything right um, it's got a lot of close encounters in it 
but, yes. it, but it does have a lot of signs in it. You mentioned Shyamalan, and it does remind me a lot of signs as signs, well. Signs, that's it, yeah. Um, I like the creature. It's it's a very strange creature design, um, kind of like Arrival a little bit, maybe. Um, well, to me, it was more like a, his version of a, a cosmic horror kind of creature. Because yes. it was all tentacly, sometimes square, sometimes not fractal. Well, and sometimes it looks like a it kite. Is a kite. It was just some, some weirdness to it, uh, which I thought was very interesting. Right. Um, but I mean, I loved how it was like sucking things up into it and eating things. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I don't want to give too much away because there is there was a lot of sh there was a big shroud of secrecy around this movie because I didn't want you to know what it was about. And right. then once it came out, I'm still not quite sure. I know what it's about. Agreed. Well, and that was my kind of thing. I didn't know <laughs> what to think of it. I didn't know what to think of some of the choices of casting and choices of performances. Um, I mean, Kaluuya basically for a lot of the movie is basically expressionless. He's laid back, but I like him in it. <laughs> I, I do like him. And I think he's a great actor in general. Right. Um, and I love. Um, Kiki what Palmer is, is his sister. Kiki, I couldn't think of her name. Kiki Palmer. She's yeah. great. Stephen Young is great. And I love him and had not seen him in anything since The Walking Dead. So I was really grateful to see him in it. Was he the cable guy? No, he's the the owner of the rodeo. The cowboy. cowboy yeah. owner. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's been like buying the horses to feed to the alien or yeah. to the entity or whatever you want to call it. Um, no, it's an alien. It's definitely yeah. an alien. Well, I mean, it's like you said, it's cosmic kind of too. So it could be maybe interpreted both ways. Maybe uh, that's that's where I'm, I'm like you. I got very confused. I mean, there's with, no origin, you know, where it came from as far as a planet, It, you know. Right, right. Could have been dimensional, as you said, you know, could be. Uh, uh, but yeah, but I, I, I just found it very, a, a very strange movie to like or dislike. Uh, so, so, it, it, but it was interesting. I, I think the list. most important thing about Jordan Peele is that none of his movies can really be categorized. I mean, all of his movies are vastly original, and I think this one was. Yes, and I think, but I do think the core that goes through all three of his films currently is this domestic horror. It is something that is affecting a family somehow. In the first one, it's him and his girlfriend, and he thinks, you know, they're going to be married, yada, yada, all of this. And the family suburban situation is way different than what he thought it was sort of thing. And it's Stepford and all that. But then in, in us, again, it's this family trying to stay together, refracted with what happens. Um, and this is the same way here. Starts out with dad and son. Then dad gets killed, goes to, you know, son and daughter. Or son and sister. Yeah, uh, I, I was going to say the familial part you're spot on with, but it's also small horror too. That like I like where yes. it does just you know it deals with just a small group of people, and he deals with a these unit. great, like to your to your point, small horror situations so well. Like the scene in, um, um, um. um What's the first one? Get out that I Get remember out. so much is the first scene in the chair with the teacup and everything. It's just mm -hmm. horrific. It's just gets, you know, but it's so intimate and small, but it gets horrific. Uh, in this one, it's the same thing, like the scene in when they're both in the house and it's just raining stuff on top of them and they see it coming before then. And it's all that terror of, do we run hide the barn? No, we stay here. Where do we, where do we stay here? What happens? You know, it was just, intimate horror small horror to your yeah. point yeah I, I think jordan peele's gifted i i'm really impressed by him like i would put him up there in a lot of these directors that we talk about like him i definitely think he Mike becomes flanagan, a flanagan flanagan yeah. ty west ty west um uh <laughs> i've lost train of thought but i mean all these these young new horror directors that are starting to to have a canon of three or more movies. Yeah. And, and another um, thing that I was going to say about it is that 
I like him so much that it has inspired me to to check out his version of the Twilight Zone. I want to watch that now. I do the, too. The do ones too. that are on Paramount. Because so. again, it's it's what he seems to do best, and it's what kind of what we're you know what we're into this week, which is this combo of horror and science fiction. How do they work together? More leaning toward horror than science fiction, but still there. Sorry. Right. <laughs> so that's a nice little segue. <laughs> no, oh yeah, actually it is. So. Nope. Where we um, I would uh, definitely recommend Nope, though, for sure. I think people that are fans of him should watch it, It though and, it is a little more sci-fi than horror. And it should go onto our list. Uh, so. Absolutely. It's on yep. there already. All yep. of his are on there. Um, so that so. Uh, little segue of sci-fi horror is a, a doozy, and it is part of a double feature that we are doing today. Um. <laughs> oh, and, and and I also had uh, my genre week was a post apocalyptic, and so is this as well. So uh, there's yeah. more than one um, segue. We today are going to talk about adaptations, two in particular, of Richard Matheson's novel "I Am Legend," and they include the movies "The Last Man on Earth." And the Omega Man, mm -hmm. uh, the last man on earth came out in 1964. It's a black and white Italian U S joint production starring Vincent price. And then, um, just what seven short years later, Charlton Heston teamed up, uh, with some American, uh, producers and did, uh, a seventies color version called the Omega man that drastically, uh, deviates a little bit as far as the story um <laughs> well let me ask to start with i have sure. never read the the novel and i know you have is is how if you had to rate which one of these is closest adaptation out of any novel? movie that has ever been well I, there is actually a short film i've never seen because it's spanish and i've been trying to get a copy of it or trying to find a copy of it and i can't it's called less uh, no, it's called Soy Leyenda, and it's a little 30 minute film that's in black and white that I would like to see that could be potentially better. But if you're going to rank these movies, including the Will Smith I Am Legend that came out in 2007, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Last Man on Earth is by far the closest to the book. To the book. Okay. It is. It All is right. not a great movie, but it is, as far as an adaptation, the closest to the novel. Hmm. Okay. Um, the novel does have a lot more sci-fi to it than maybe the movie Last Man on Earth did. I mean, I can't remember. Was he a scientist in that? Yeah, he was a doctor. Okay. Okay. Um, I get them confused. But uh, basically. Well, in both of these today, <laughs> the lead Neville's character worked uh, with trying to create a vaccine for the disease. Mm-hmm. And so. the disease is vampirism. It's just the scientific version of it. Right. In the right. novel. And, and that's, that's what makes this kind of hard because the novel is one of my favorite novels. As you said, I have read it, but I have read it like 10 times. I've read it a lot. Wow. Okay. And yeah, it's one of those I pick up like every two years and reread because it's real fast. It's real easy. Um, I, when I was living with you, I bought a copy of the original paperback and actually like gently read it because it was falling to pieces because it was okay. from 1954, which is when it was published. Um, it is uh, basically about the last man alive in a world of vampires and the vampires, even though they stick to the traditions of garlic and steaks through the heart. It's he it, Richard Matheson layers on a scientific reasoning for why this is happening, which is kind of fun because that is what they try to do with the Will Smith version, but they take it too far and it gets into weird mutations and it's just too many special effects. And to me, it's much more effective, very much like my, my novel that I basically based on this story as did George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, you mm -hmm. know, people trapped in a house. <laughs> well, this is one man trapped in a house. He can't go out at night. He can only go out in the daytime because the vampires will get him at night. And at night they harass him. They bang on his house all night long and keep him up shouting, Neville, Neville, you know, come out, come out to play mm -hmm. for lack of better words. Um, 
So if I sound a little jumpy, it's just because I've got three movies and a novel in my head that I'm trying to decipher here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the things I love about it is the you know scientific vampirism. You know, mm -hmm. essentially uh, biological. It, it's bacterial in uh, the Last Man on Earth. I think it's viral in uh, Omega Man because uh, they call it a virus, uh, mm. but it creates this vampiric tendencies. Um, although I don't think either of them really, I think last man on earth portrays the, how do we keep them away more vampiric or traditional vampire mm -hmm. rather than what do they do? You know, do they bite you? Do they eat you? Do they suck your blood? Do they, we don't get really any of that, uh, really in, in either of these, um, so that the one component of vampirism being surviving off of the blood of the living doesn't seem to, to be present, at least in the, like I said, I haven't read the novels, so I, so I couldn't tell you. Um, but it even inspired, like it, it inspired your novel, inspired my play, Nosferatu, which we did, mm -hmm. uh, which was the same thing. It's based in science, not in, you know, Gothic myth or whatever, or legend um, sort of thing, which I like a lot. It's one of the elements I really do like about this. Um, this book, because it, it was, you know, in research, it was called the first modern vampire story, but right. novel. Yeah. Which I thought was a great, that's a great key for this. Uh, well, and, and, and Stephen King in turn is a great key to it as well, because he was always also compared to bringing horror into the modern world. Right. Yeah. Right. 30 um, years later. And, and I have a confession. I had never seen the last men on earth until this week. Um, what'd you think? <laughs> um, I, Hang on. Got to fix that. Uh, cut that, David. No. Um, <laughs> it. I, I, I wasn't a big fan of it, uh, honestly. Okay. I, I, I had uh, when it came down to it, I really. I'll, I'll, I'll preface it. Both of these okay. movies. Well, my preface for Omega Man was, you know, I remembered this being a lot better than it is. <laughs> until i watched it again and for this one it is i wanted it to be a lot better than it is okay i think um i think both of them have the same struggle that you have in post-apocalyptic in general which is if you have a solitary figure unless you're going to do narration or have them talk to themselves or be extremely clever cinematically which takes a lot of time and effort and everything else it's hard to tell their story it's hard to get it out and across. Um, mm -hmm. In a novel, it's easier, I think, much more easier because, of course, you have all the interior dialogue. Internal monologue. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Um, and, and in both movies, they try to establish it and then don't and then not and do. There is no, there is no VOG really in Omega Man. This one does. So Last, Last Man on Earth has a lot at the beginning of – of uh, voice of God, of him talking over, you know, sort of thing, narration, almost, yes. almost like it's a, he's entering into a diary or something like that. Uh, it's so, funny that you mentioned that because I think this movie would have been much better in Medius Rest without that narration. Agreed. Uh, because what does work, the hook in this movie is awesome. The very beginning of this, we're just showing those still, kind of images are located. They're not because you can see wind blowing, but you know, these different barren locations, all very montage and juxtaposed and everything else, it, lots of desolation. And then, and then suddenly after about 30 or 40 seconds, you start seeing bodies in the images too mm -hmm. and things. And that's great. And then the mm -hmm. voiceover, like you said, the voiceover kind of go, eh, did, did, did I need that? I'd much rather just watch him go through that first day. Yeah. Just let him do his routine. That's all you yeah. need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That I think would have been more compelling uh, and uh, better and everything else. And then my second really only point of overview of last man is what, what was the point of the, the creatures at all? It made a, it made no, it, the creatures themselves made no sense other than they are vampires. He calls them vampires. Literally. They don't like their reflection. They don't like garlic. He can stake them. And mm -hmm. he has also has crosses all over his house, even though nobody ever uses a crucifix or a cross. But right. then the, 
the good guys come, the new society of black comes and whatever, and just chases him for a good 10 minutes and kills him. And it's a big deus ex machina. It's like, wow, they just came out of nowhere. Yeah. 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 Came out of nowhere, obviously fairly equipped and armed and everything else. Why are there any vampires left if they have that much firepower? Right. And yet it it's just a big action chase scene that really goes nowhere. There's no final. I mean, I expect, you know, especially Matheson, I expected like a final voiceover of like that God voice saying, you know, this is the like, almost like we did when we did Incredible Shrinking Man where you're hearing Neville as he's dying say, and so this ends, da, 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 da. I'm, I, I, and maybe even go to the mythos of the book where he says, this is obviously what humans have evolved into. And I'm just, like, uh, and that's what the whole real main ending of the book is, is that the world will carry on with a new species and correct. that human, and he is legend. And the reason he's legends for many reasons, one is he's feared by both the vampires and the vampire hybrids that are the new civilization mm. because he's out there killing everybody. He doesn't distinguish. And that's why he ends up getting killed himself and is quote legend. Okay. That makes sense. Then. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and they do, they don't, do it really well in any of the movies. I mean, including that, that Will Smith one that I just refuse to cover. That's why we're covering these two. <laughs> well, I've seen the Will Smith one a couple of times, and I've also seen the counter endings and everything else. And uh, I do think they made some really bad choices in that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was good to have Smith as an actor in it, because I do think he's a very strong actor. I And I like Vincent Price in his idiom. I do not like him in this movie. No, he's miscast. Terribly, terribly yeah. miscast in this movie. <laughs> I mean, Robert Neville yeah. is, is uh, he's a man's man. Now, they went in the opposite direction with Charlton Heston, where they made him too macho. Oh, God. He's but, a parody of macho. In right, yeah. right. But he's not macho enough in this. Um, wow. So we've been all over the board talking about the plot. Um, I, I can do a little bit of post-production on this. Not much because a lot of this, a lot is not known about this film or that I can find um, very much like Night of the Living Dead. It went into public domain because of some something, some accident. I don't know. Mm. And then when I saw it originally in the nineties, I saw like a videotape that was terrible. I mean, really bad uh quality uh this movie was hard to find in the 90s that's why mm -hmm. it was kind of almost like a lost film and now that it's you know that streaming is everywhere and it's public demand it's like night of the living dead you can watch it on almost any channel <laughs> but back when i first saw it in the 90s it was a lot it was a it was a worse experience for me watching it this time on a in a real crisp print that I saw. I actually kind of enjoyed it a little bit for the the similarities to the novel. Yeah, and I had I read the novel, I probably would have enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I watched this. I watched them in order, so I watched this one first. Of course, mm -hmm. it would have been interesting to see how I would have thought about it in the opposite if I yeah. watched. So make a man again, and then watch this. Yeah. Big um, plot things in the novel. It's a very small horror novel. You know, I like those um, big plot things are the dog. The dog's a huge thing in the book because it's the only thing he's come into contact with that's living. Right. And it takes him forever to coax that dog into coming inside and, and feeding it. You know, it's, it's like days and weeks of him trying to communicate and establish a relationship with this dog. And then when he finally does and the dog ends up dying, it's just devastating. I mean, devastating in the novel. And they, mm. they do play it up a little bit in this and in the Will Smith version, but not as well as they do in, in the novel. Another thing is his wife and daughter. Um, actually, I don't know that he has a daughter. It's just his wife. I think no um, wife and daughter, the daughter dies first. Cause she goes blind first. I can't and, remember her in the book, but maybe she's in the book. <laughs> anyway, um, oh, I don't know. The, the wife coming back. The, the, the thing is, is there's this massive burn pit and, you know, they collect the bodies and they burn them because if not, they're going to come back as vampires. And, you know, there, it's a little bit religious, but it's like 
I don't want my wife to go to the pit, so I'm going to bury her. What does she do? She comes back very Salem's lot. You know, she's at the door that very night, you know, saying, let me in, let me yeah. in. Yeah. And that's a really creepy part in the novel as well. Okay. Um, and that scene, if we're going to talk scene, sticks out to me in this as well. Um, I think it's a good scene. The origins of this movie, the book was very popular. Uh, like I said, it came out in 1954. Uh, Hammer was originally going to do this with Fritz wow. Lang directing. That would have been interesting. Well, <laughs> Richard Matson was all in. He was like, uh, Fritz Lang, Hammer Films, yes, let's do it. Um, however, Hammer Films somehow dropped out, Fritz Lang dropped out, and all of a sudden things started changing. It became like an Italian American mishmash production. And you'll notice that. Richard Matheson has his pseudonym on the film. It doesn't say Richard Matheson. It says Logan Swanson. Oh, okay. I could and, not find Logan Swanson, so that's why I thought it was interesting. Yeah. Well, Logan Swanson is the name he used on things he didn't want his name attached to. Oh, okay. So he did not like this movie, and he really did not like uh, Vincent Price in the part. Even though he worked, obviously, with Roger Borman and Vincent Price later on, um, he did not want that Richard, I mean, um, Vincent in this movie. Vincent Price. Okay. Yes. Um, it was uh, obviously the screenplay was him because he had developed it for Hammer and for Fritz Lang. So a lot of that is him, but they also brought in a television writer named William Leish, Leish, Leicester. Leicester. Uh, that's yep. a that's a very British name. So maybe he was a British television writer. Um, and then directors, uh, Italian directors, Ubaldo Ragonia. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the U.S. director was Sidney Salkow. Um, lots of these names I'm just not really familiar with and, and really don't care about. Uh, well, one this, of the things this had that feel of and, and I want to it, it probably says a lot that I haven't uh, done it from my own personal uh, knowledge base. But to look back, did suddenly in the. In this, these couple of decades of the 50s and 60s, did Italy just have a lot of money and want to invest in movies? Because Italian cinema started infiltrating, especially British cinema, U.S. cinema, everything. So I, I, it seems like a strange period when they either had Italian producers or they had a lot of money men and a lot of money coming from Italy. You know, uh, that's even a down good question. You know, I, I, even down to, you know, uh, 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 De Laurentiis, you know, through the 70s and 80s. Right. Um, they've had this influence because I did read that this was actually shot in Italy, mm -hmm. you know, which it looks like it. Some of those buildings, especially. Well, and there are a couple of times when the car has its uh, steering wheel on the wrong side. Or all the cars, the models look different. They don't look oh, like yeah. anything in the U.S. They don't yes. look like the U.S. Yeah. Right. Um. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer, but I have so many theories that are, are little pieces of information that uh -huh. add up to that. Like, I mean, Fr Frederico Fellini was really popular around that time. Yep. Um, also, I talked about this in another podcast that we did where one actor advised another B actor that if you're not working in the U.S., go to Italy or go to mm -hmm. Europe and you will get. Uh, oh, it was Robert England. He said um, someone had advised him to go to England or, or Europe and work there until they need you in America. That way you're constantly getting checks and you're not starving or what have you. And you also keep your popularity and your image out there. So there's that as well. And I mean, that may explain why Vincent Price was in it. I don't know. Maybe. Well, it was also AIP, right? So that's Samuel Is it Arkoff. AIP? Yeah, it was distributed by AIP. Okay. All right. Well, that explains a lot too. Yeah, um, but I didn't a, see Corman's name on it. No, no. Well, you didn't see Arkov's name on it either, but it was an AIP distribution. I think okay. they just bought the movie and distributed it. Must have. And like they I did. said, it lost. Uh, I mean, it went public domain and then nobody owned it. So right. um, what else? Uh, like I said, it's the first of three feature length adaptations. However, there is a short version called Soy Leyenda that was done in Spain. I would love to see that. I've seen clips from it and it looks really creepy and mm -hmm. it is in black and white as well. Um, the, the one difference is in the novel, the vampires were 
fast and agile and a threat. In this, they're slow moving and lumbering and they don't even have fangs. And I'm kind of grateful for that because I think that's what helped inspire George Merritt to deny the living dead. Oh, obviously, <laughs> obviously, without a doubt. Yeah, because uh, that, yeah. that is well, probably the biggest key from this movie is not the living dead. I did find in my research, you were mentioning versions that three or four different people mention a direct to video feature film called I am Omega. And they say it is a great version of this of the novel you know i read something about that but i can't yeah. remember why i didn't include it it's from 2007 i look in my notes it's not it a says, documentary no 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 it's a feature link direct to video yeah. i need to see that it is considered what's my notes say uh, the film is an unofficial and uncredited adaptation of the 54 novel i am legend by richard Mills. Interesting. So I am Omega. And uh, they combined it, like it with the title from the Charlton Heston yeah. movie, which is very go. strange. Yeah. They very, should have called strange. it. I am the last Omega on earth. And then you would have all three movies together. But, <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to get to the Omega man because I have some ties to that movie that I love. Um, yeah. What, uh, before we move on though, um, I, I've got a little bit on cast. I don't really have much else on this film because, like I said, there wasn't much about it for years and years. Um, Vincent Price admitted to having a fondness for the movie, and he thinks it's superior to the Omega Man. <laughs> of course he does. <laughs> but, of course, Charlton Heston, I will get to in the next feature, thought that this movie sucked. Um, I think that Price, by far, is the best actor in this movie, which says a lot since he's miscast. Yeah. Uh, I do not like any of the other characters in this uh, uh, performance. It's because it, they're all Italian. They're, right. They're, his, they're dubbed. <laughs> his, everything is dubbed. His daughter is terrible. The audio quality throughout <laughs> this is horrible. I mean, the machine, the guns sound terrible. The cars sound terrible. All the audio mix is bad. Music. The music. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> is so over the top and does not need to be there. Um but uh, it's, you know, the worst hand grenades I've ever seen. Uh, I guess they're smoke bombs. They look like be. sparklers when they get lit. Yeah. Or, and then you throw them and they just do like a flash pod. Poof. Yeah. <laughs> like a magician smoke. trick. <laughs> so what was it? Yeah. Uh, uh, but I do, you know, again, I, I'm conflicted on it because I do kind of like the structure. I like some of the choices he makes, you know, how barren everything looks. And I think the black and white helps with that post-apocalyptic feel to everything, mm -hmm. the isolation. Um, I feel more for Vincent Price's Neville than I do Charlton Heston's Neville. Because Charlton Heston's a jerk. <laughs> yeah, but his loneliness, <laughs> his isolation, the fact yeah. that just seeing the dog you know, made him almost panic and run after it and everything, that sort of thing. Uh, and I do like the hook. I thought the hook in this was great. Whereas the hook in Omega Man is terrible. So, so those are my, the my, hook. What's the, which the, hook are the you? opening, like three minutes, how they hook it was both of them are similar. And then they, they start with no credit roll or anything else yet. They just start with uh, uh, images and music and stuff and then a few minutes later after a climax of sorts they go into the title sequence agreed um, but i like the i would almost i would say i like the hook in omega man better because it lacks that narration and i think it's better not knowing you know what i'm saying yeah i, I like agreed. i like just seeing him go through an empty city you know with dead bodies everywhere i'm like this is fantastic yeah. when i was a kid i just ate that up yeah. Uh, with the Vincent Price thing, it's like, you know, my wife has been dead and the people are out to get me or whatever. Right. So. Well, and one of the keys I have for both of these is Mad Max, that post-apocalyptic lone hero or lone person we're focusing on kind of story uh, that is, you know, mostly post-apocalyptic. I only say that because in doing research, I saw that Richard Matheson said he would love to have seen Harrison Ford and George Miller do a remake of this project. Oh, that would have been a great. That would have been went, awesome. Oh my gosh. That would have been awesome. Absolutely. Well, and so Harrison, Harrison Ford is the right amount of macho. Yes. He's that too. good macho to intellect, mm -hmm. to loneliness, emotive. kind See, of. See, I've always thought Bruce Willis would be good in this part too. 
I could see him doing it. I could see that too. Yeah. Because Bruce can play human and superhero both. Mm, uh, interesting. And that, that's, uh, so, so then we go on to, we jump a couple of decades and well, do hang another on. one. Um, I got just a little bit more. Oh, you got cast. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, da, 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 da. Like for we some said, reason, folks, we're unscripted. <laughs> so, yeah. well, the, well, I was talking about Vincent Price. One of the things that's, di- I mentioned that the, the vampires are a little bit different in this. They're slower and less agile, but another difference in this. And for uh, the only r- film I know that does this, they change his name from Robert Neville to Robert Morgan. And I don't understand why they did that. Okay. I can't like, think of that because I knew his name was Neville when I was watching and you hear the guy outside going, oh, oh, yeah. I'm going, is he saying Neville? That's a weird pronunciation of Neville. No. And uh, by the way, and I mentioned the important parts of the novel, the dog and the wife being two major plot devices in the novel. Another one is Ben Cortman, the one that is always out there shouting at him saying, Neville, Neville. Right. Well, Ben Cortman was a neighbor, so they knew each other before this went down. So that's another plot point in the novel as well. Ben and in Cortman. this, he was another scientist who knew him. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And one, in one of them he was, yeah. <laughs> in last- um, and then let's see, uh, so I mentioned the Morgan... Uh, Hammer, uh, like I said, tried to get this going in the late 50s as a movie called Night Creatures, uh, and they had a cast of uh, or at least choices for Robert Neville to be Stanley Baker, Paul Massey, Lawrence Harvey and Kieran Moore. The only of those people I recognize is Paul Massey. I don't recognize anybody else, but. And then, like I said, the rest of the cast is Italian. Um, I have nothing else except a little bit of trivia. Heston obviously viewed this film before proceeding with his remake of The Omega Man. He describes it as incredibly botched, totally unfrightening, ill-acted, sloppily written, and photographed. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, he was being a real meanie. Um, And then uh, do you want to do a few keys? for this or do you want to move on and come back to key i have a few so i have of course it's based on a novel called i am legend okay Uh, um (laughs) neither the living dead you definitely said and you not only see that in the slow moving but the way he kind of shot some of those night scenes Mm -hmm. in the the heavy shadows and the way they're walking away from the camera toward staggering toward the uh, house and all that uh, of course, I've got Omega Man, which we'll talk about next. And then my other one was what I said was Mad Max, uh, that kind of lone isolationist sort of uh, post-apocalyptic tale. So. Yeah. Um, I, one, I mean, there's several reasons this is connected to Night of the Living Dead. But another one is the fact that they both lost their copyright. <laughs> mm-hmm. Both these films have been out there for people to to use as they will for decades because something happened legally and uh, nobody owns them um and then what uh, i have one other key that i lifted from imdb it said during the scene where morgan is attacked by vampires there's a score played that is nearly identical to the music that plays during the cormoran giant attack in jack the giant killer so Okay. Anyway, it's a music key, I guess that I, I'm unaware of. So, but that that is really all I have on that film. I, I knew we would be moving on to the Mega Man quicker because there's just not a lot out there that I can find about this movie. Right. So, um, the Omega Man, um, basically to 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 go forward with another little synopsis is basically the same plot, but instead of Instead of vampires, they're mutants. They're like these albino type mutants that are violent and they're like a religious cult. (laughs) They add, they throw in all these things from the 1970s, I guess, to make it more relevant because it was shortly after the Manson murders. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it is such a strange thing, but I have very fond m- movie memories of this movie. <laughs> I mean, when I was a kid, my mother let me watch this movie on television when it broadcasted probably in 1972 or 73. 
on ABC, you know, Monday night at the movies or whatever, because Charlton Heston was in it. My mother had the hots for Charlton Heston. I think I've told you this when we yep. did Planet of the Apes. She actually had a pencil sketch of him framed. <laughs> <laughs> she was a big fan. So he was a man's man. You know, <laughs> and so. my dad did kind of resemble him. So okay. he, because he was in it, it was okay for an eight year old to watch this horror movie. And I dug it, man. I was totally into those. I mean, the, seeing those corpses and stuff scared the shit out of me, mm -hmm. you know, as a kid. So of I course. have a lot of fond me memory memories of this movie even though it is it's really schlocky now when you watch uh yeah it 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 um what are your original memories of it the same thing i remember the uh the post-apocalyptic feel of you know walking through grocery stores that were totally empty being on the street all of that i definitely remembered matthias i remembered his name even um, and the white hair and those albino looks with all the black robes. I always remember that was great. Um, I remember the kiss, of course, because I think other than Star Trek, it was the first time I'd ever seen that. It may have been um, the first cinematic one. I don't know. A lot of people, a lot of the research says that it's the Does first it? okay. interracial kiss on screen on, on movies. Um, but you know, Star Trek beat it by a few years with on television. Um, right. But the um, and then I also I've always remembered the ending, the ending of this crucified sort of guy and the 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 blood, the little girl with the hat, that scene of the ending without dialogue or anything. I always remembered it was very burned in my it's mind. It's a that's little why. heavy handed. Yeah, but that's why I think going into it, I was thinking, oh, yeah, I remember. Oh, I can't wait. We're going to get there. It's going to be really cool. It's going to make a lot of sense. It's going to work. No, it's like thrown in. And I found out in research that it was thrown in because it was thrown in. Heston actually was the one that came up with the idea of just putting his arms out because it's not practical or physical. His arms will be down by his side. They're not held up on anything. No, but he's also got his legs together and tilted to the side. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a classic oh, yeah. crucifixion pose. He's yes. literally looking like jesus christ in that yeah. picture in, in my note that is seen. my note is his ending pose is a traditional crucifix which we don't see one of in this entire movie <laughs> no because they're not vampires <laughs> yeah they they just punted that whole vampire thing no, out, they're out they're the hippie freaks <laughs> they're a cult they're a manson cult they yeah. are and and matthias like you said you remember his name obviously takes the place of ben courtman from the original and instead of ben Instead of Matthias being his neighbor, Matthias is a newscaster that he sees yep. frequently when the destruction of the world is happening and the virus is released. It's like it's a bio weapon thing, right? Well, and because he's it's military, kinda, it's jumping ahead a little bit, but I think it will cloak all of my comments for this entire movie. Mm -hmm. TV is the biggest key to this movie, in my opinion. It's a television director who directs it like it's a television made for television movie sort of thing down to the lighting, the framing, everything is mm -hmm. television and making the villain a television newscaster who probably knows a, or ended up knowing a lot of stuff that wasn't reported. So he has a vendetta against society because I think he kind of sees that they let this happen. And that kind of gives him a motivation, which I do think Zerba Anthony Zerb plays. Mm -hmm. Um, but television is crucial to this entire movie. It looks like a movie. television movie, oh even gosh. though it's not. It's not. It went to theaters. <laughs> no, so but he was so used to it coming from television. Mm. That's how he lit the scenes. That's how he directed it. That's how mm -hmm. he shot it. It is so television. I mean, it is a bad Columbo episode, you know, kind I, of thing. I literally have in my production notes, director Boris Segal, TV and crap. Writer John Corrington and Joyce Corrington, TV and crap. That's exactly Obviously. what I have written down. Obviously. <laughs> so true. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it is, it is, it is a huge influence. Uh, I can tell you something funny. Yeah. <laughs> Guess who Charlton Heston approached to direct it? Orson Welles. No. Exactly. No, are you serious? <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> he had done Touch of Evil with Orson Welles, and they were friends. And he said, I think that you should 
direct this I movie. I think Orson would be great. And the reason why this is out there is Charlton <laughs> Heston has a biography. And so a lot of information about this movie is out there because of his biography. And he did ask Orson Welles if he would direct this movie. Wow. Um, Richard Matheson says that this movie is so removed from his book that it doesn't even bother him. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, it's its own little movie over there, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it doesn't even bother me because uh, it's so not my movie, not, not my novel. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, it came under heavy criticism for violent content. I don't really. I mean, by today's standard, it's, it is tame. I'm trying to think of what would have been violent that they're talking about other than like him running the the cult member into the wall with his car and well, setting one on shots. fire yeah uh, the way what's his name dies on the impaled fence which we didn't get okay to that see. was pretty gruesome yeah but that was cool it was uh, cool i also love the when we were talking about heston as neville in the beginning driving around the city way too fast because you know you're going to have an accident or a flat tire um, but he'll just stop the car because he sees a shadow and just takes a machine gun out and starts and just start, yeah, spraying the walls with. Yeah, <laughs> there's Perfect. lots of gunfire in this movie because they're not vampires. So you can use guns. Yeah. Um, this movie grossed twenty nine thousand dollars in its first week and went on to earn four million in the United States and Canada. So it was a pretty decent hit for the time. Yeah. Well, uh, um. And then I have the uh, early in the film, Neville sees a calendar dated March of 1975. Well, we know the movie came out in 71, so they only set it in the distant future. However, right. he is constantly going to a movie theater to watch a movie that's obviously been playing forever because no one's there to change it. And it is Woodstock from 1970, well, the prior indeed. year. And the reason I read and I have in notes, the only reason they use that movie is because it was also produced and owned by Warner Brothers. So it was the same studio. Oh, well, that and makes that's sense. How, that's I thought they that they might have done it just to jab no, because Charlton cause, Heston because he's a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because, and it was a bunch also, of hippies. <laughs> there's also nothing. <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know the theme of this movie. I don't know what the theme is trying to say, uh, because none of neither of these movies tap onto the, like you said, the important thing, which was him slowly coming to the realization that he's the extinct one, the minority, he's yes. the minority. They're the new evolution of man kind of thing. And that would have been so cool in this, um, especially with this cult kind of mentality. But instead, this one gives us just like the Will Smith one. This one gives us this nice, happy, you know, uh, society is going to live on through my blood serum sort of uh, ending, which I thought was a total cop out. Um, but uh, it, it, so I, I'm curious about why, what they structured the theme to be in this and why they did it that way. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, uh, I, I'm just looking through notes because I've got, I got, took a ton of notes on this one just because I was, my mind was was going, you know, crazy. Star skin um, hatching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there was a lot of, you know, this makes no freaking sense. Like, do we really? Yeah. So evidently they know how the 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 good guys, I guess the 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 we live in the hills kid cult or the kid, the, the ones the that are like the hybrid. Yeah, the hippie virus. hybrids. They carry the virus, but they don't show it yet or whatever. Yeah. Right. They they know how to turn on Dodger Stadium, all of the lighting in it, and they can just turn it on whenever they want to or whatever. I just that was and then that whole sequence of <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna speak like I'm a Black Panther to you, as that's my character introduction. Um, and I'm going to beat you over the head with my gun and then have you drive the motorcycle, <laughs> you know, do all the stunts. It just, uh, it yeah, was, it was almost a weird anti-feminist moment because she was like so strong. And then all of a sudden, but I don't know how to drive a motorcycle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. made no sense. She should have jumped on there and then said, get on, buddy. Right. You know, uh, that's the way it would be done these days. But no, yeah. you can't do that with Charlton Heston. He has to be in front. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he does. 
Um, and now, like, how many times does he take his shirt off in this movie? I was like, is this William Shatner? What's going on, man? <laughs> I, I have that in my notes. I have that. It's William Shatner. Or does his contract have a no shirt clause? Right. Because it is, he has not know, got a great body. <laughs> not really. No, no. No. And but, you know, there you go. Yeah. Uh, and right, that, I guess that was my issue. Muscle bound. But <laughs> Because I, I wanted to like it so much that I kept just seeing all the holes in it and all the problems that it had with it. It had red Italian blood. You know, I don't like that. It'll immediately turn it looks off like paint. the movie. Yeah. It looks <laughs> like bad tempera paint that, a, you know, a preschooler is using. Right. Um, it's got, uh, um, what, where's my other one right here? I didn't like all the God shots. They don't work in this. They don't show all of, you know, when he would, they, they would do this huge zoom back to show empty space with him on the street or whatever, or him just getting out of his car, all mm -hmm. these God shots with no narration. They don't work. They don't make sense. Right. Why we, why we would have those. It also um, ties into terrible logic problems because it's the city of Los Angeles. And whenever they pull back, you see how big it is. And yet he keeps running into the same people. <laughs> Right, yeah. <laughs> or, or and you, exactly where to go. And the the second shot of this movie, the first shot is a long shot showing the red, you know, the red Corvette that he's driving, and then the second shot is a close up of him, you know, driving. In the background, you see cars moving. Oh, do you? In the second shot. Oh, that going, sucks. Oh my God, guys! I just you know, and there's several of those where you see people in the background or people moving like three blocks away. You see, and people. yet The Walking Dead can make Atlanta look deserted in 2010. Yes, yeah. right, <laughs> totally deserted. Uh, you know, um, uh, I've got comparing the music in this. The music in the first one is terrible because mm -hmm. it is so bombastic and so ever present. It's, it's just dramatic, it's just, overly dramatic. It's just overly dramatic. The music mm -hmm. in this has no drama whatsoever to it. It is terrible. It, it is, is like, like bad Star music. Skin Hutch. Yes, it is yes. bad television action adventure music, and it does not work at all. The dun, love dun, dun, music dun. doesn't work. The jazz they pick doesn't work. The music is just bad. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, another very important element in in the novel and in the movies is him discovering the first other human being which is a female right in this one he's going through a department store looking and, and wearing crappy clothes he's always wearing like these leisure suits i mean these uh <laughs> oh my god like jogging suits and and i'm like it, he's really going around shooting people in the daytime wearing that like safari jacket or whatever it is i don't know yeah. it was strange uh, and it looks thrift, brand new thrift store. I mean, it bad. looks mini pearl new, like it would still have the tag on it. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. All of them do. But anyway, he he finds the woman in this one. They do a little bit of a trick where he's looking at some mannequins because he thinks he saw one move and she's posing and, and trying to be completely still. And she is in this pose that is like nothing you would ever see a mannequin do. Oh, yeah. It's like this weird Hindu yogi position. On I thought one it leg. Like, I'm like, what mannequin does that? <laughs> I thought it looked like a weird Starsky and H or Charlie's Angels pose. <laughs> yes, with her arm. Yes, you know? exactly. I, it, to me, it was more like a, a meditation yoga yeah. thing. But yeah. yes, yeah. very much so. I'm like, no mannequins do that. No, you know, he's going to know you're real. <laughs> uh, oh gosh, yeah, yeah. Um, and and that was. <laughs> But I mean, as much as we trash this movie, I love this movie and could watch it again right now. <laughs> are you Tell serious? You. Yes. Oh my gosh. You I love so... this movie. Um, and I mean, Anthony Zerb is just a great character actor. And Charlton Heston is so over the top that he's entertaining in himself. Oh my gosh. I would just, because I, I think he could have handled it had he had a better script. I think he could have handled all that loneliness and isolation and playing chess with yourself and trying to keep up the society that you once preserved. I mean, one of the things I didn't mention about last man on earth that I liked was he wired his own house with electricity. They took the time to have all these hanging cables and lighting and everything because he wouldn't have it hooked up. He, he had to jury rig it himself kind of thing. I and he wouldn't that. have an elevator, which Charles Nesson has an elevator, which, uh, which we obviously see through the plot makes no freaking sense. If you're going right. to be attacked. You wouldn't want that at all, period. No. Um, and I've got other stuff, too, in my notes. Like, I've got um, 
Okay, so this plague obviously killed all the predators of spiders because there's cobwebs on literally everything. Every place he goes in to make it seem old and worn has cobwebs everywhere, all over the food, all over the doors, all over the tables. I was going, really? And it's been three that years. Oh, it's wow. been three years. I don't think there'd be that many cobwebs. They're everywhere. Um, now, the bodies alone make it desiccated, or, or the desiccated bodies make it look old to me. See, that would I would have loved more of that when he goes, he kicks open the hotel room door and then goes over and thinks they're behind the under the bed and pulls the sheet back and it's the dead couple. Yeah. And, there, and there's one early on that they cut away from really fast. And I was like, why are they cutting away if they're going to be all this violence? Why can't they show the dead body? I didn't yeah. understand. The mirror scene where he's buying the new car, just like Vincent Price did in Last Man on Earth. And mm-hmm. he looks over and all suddenly the guy sitting at the table over there is a, over there is a dead body, you know, a desiccated corpse kind of thing. That was great. Yeah, uh, very much the stand. I mean, that's a key. And, and one of the reasons I chose it as my topic this week is because yeah. uh, it reminds me of the stand when they're walking around and there's just dead bodies everywhere. Several of those long shots, too, if you look at those long shots, or even some of the smaller ones when he's walking, like after he wrecks the car and he's walking away from it, the streetlights are working. And they wouldn't be working. It just bugged the hell out of me. I was going, see? It's the little things. I'm so bored. I'm so upset with this movie. The little things are bugging Uh, me. Like, why um, doesn't Dutch wear a shirt? That leather's got to be uncomfortable. Why is he dressed like a... Is that the one that knows how to turn on all the stadium lights? I think it is. Dutch is the... The, the the leader of the other guy. The one that That's you would think would be her boyfriend, but apparently isn't. Apparently isn't. Yeah. Right. He's just a med student who knows all about him. You know, the the helicopter crash. There's no freaking way anybody survived that. And he's like right I beside think he, it. Oh, I know. Yeah. Uh, it's a great. I liked it, though. I thought it was a pretty cool crash. Oh, it was it, a great crash. Yeah, but, it kind of went out of frame. But I mean, it, it looked like it was going to crash, but then it immediately cuts to him in the bushes with blood all over him. Like yeah. He, like he unless jumped you, out last Unless minute. you immediately go to boop, 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 and it's, you know, Steve Austin or whatever. That's not yeah. going to work. Well, yeah. I mean, he could have jumped out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think it's funny is that in this one, they make him military and a scientist. He's like a military scientist that has the cure and he's going to save the world and the Correct. damn helicopter crashes. Yeah. Again, had it been a little bit of a script, a script tweak and actually directed cinematically, not television, it might have worked. Maybe. That he literally is the last savior and mm-hmm. it didn't work kind of thing. Um, where, where did Matthias and his guys get all these freaking glasses? I, I mean, think it's got, funny when they do the reveal, they all take off their mirror sunglasses. Right. This is Which, our ugliness or whatever. Yeah. This is the mark. I think he says, or something like that. Um, uh, which, which I loved. I like their makeup. I like the albino makeup. I love the contact lenses. I think the white hair work. I think they make them very creepy and scary. And then the fact that even on top of that, they're not mindless roaming zombies. They are, a cult. They're a, a, a cultural organization, a group. I thought would have been cool too. I, d- I just don't think they, they did it as well as they could have. It. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I have so many good nostalgic vibes from this movie. <laughs> and I was really pleasantly surprised to find that I had it on DVD. So I oh had a really gosh. good copy of it. It had a, uh, a making of, well, not a making of, but a little bit mini doc on there. Yeah. As well, that was kind of fun. Um, well, let's talk else? about good things. I will say a good thing about it is her reveal mm-hmm. is actually one of my favorite moments in this movie. The fact that the mannequin, <laughs> no, her 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 turn, I guess the turn reveal, because she says the th- comment about, "Oh, baby, I've never seen anything in these stores more dangerous. The only thing, the most dangerous thing I ever seen in any of these stores was you, which yeah. means I'm going to die." Basically, it means my character's dead. Kind of, uh, she's like she should have been a kitten, you know, kind of thing. Anyway, she goes away. He does the whole thing with the kid I didn't like, which is another frustration to this movie. Is that Richie? whole Jesse, that whole Richie character? Well, you should um, like him. Why? Because he went on to be a director of things like uh, Agents of Shield and Lost. 
Yeah, I think as a director, he's great. I think as a as a, <laughs> as a, as a child actor, he's pretty terrible. And well, I do I remember mind. him from like 70s sitcoms and stuff. Yeah, he's not yeah. horrible, but his dialogue and the script and what he's told to do is bad. You know, well, come on, he's, man, he's, they're just like us, you know. Yeah. Why, why? Why don't you? Why do you kill them? Why don't you give them the serum? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You violent. You. you violent, man. Or yeah, whatever. I mean, he's supposed to be the moral compass, and he's just not a very good actor. Right. And or yeah. we could have played that with a little bit of scripting, you know, made that, that better. But I love, you know, they kill him. Then they go to march on <clears throat> Neville and they're coming down the, the street at night and they're all a mob and it's scary. And suddenly she's there with the groceries and she drops the groceries and you go, Oh my God, she better run. She better run. And instead she takes her glasses off and she's turned and takes her. I, I see off. why you like that cinematically. Yeah. But to me, it just seemed like contrived. It seemed very plot oh, it is. contrived. It's horrible, yeah. But so is everything else, you know, <laughs> kind of, uh, I mean, yeah. Like her going to the store in the first place. It's like, bitch, why yes. do you need to go to the store? <laughs> and even if you were going to the store, staying out after night when at you dark. Know yes. What exactly. this is like. Yeah. That's horribly contrived. I mean, dressing up like Austin Powers for dinner is contrived too, but we accept it, you know, that Heston's going to do that. Or well, and they also hop into the bed really quickly. And I was like, in Dutch. Maybe her boyfriend. I didn't yeah. know. Right, right. You yeah, know. but her out after. But I did like the cinematic. You know, that was a nice little plot twist that in a novel mm -hmm. would probably have been really great. You know, when you read that and got to the end of the chapter and that's what happened, you go, holy shit. Yeah. Um, but then her character. So again, adds to one of my biggest disappointments, which is so the plague causes you to like Matthias and the family. That doesn't make any sense that you would suddenly adopt what they're saying is true. Uh, and she somewhere suddenly... in there when they were talking about symptoms, they mentioned that you become deranged or something that you don't that you your mind you just become a crazy person killer or whatever right which so I i'm assuming with. that was why she was automatically part of the family once she became one i don't know no, i don't think so no uh you know what that, that there sense. are far bigger stretches of logic in this than what you're implying <laughs> <laughs> yes there are okay go ahead sorry uh yes you're right uh cast sure Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston. Get your damn dirty paws off me. Uh, of his crap. salary was three hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> that's a that's a low paycheck for. Well, for these days, it is. And it was not filmed America. in Italy. So what? Is and, that? Yeah, it was what filmed in it? L.A. Obviously, oh, yeah. um, he read the original novel on an airplane coming back to L.A. He was very interested in a modern adaptation. Uh, totally unaware of the fact that it had already been made into a film called The Last Man on Earth seven years prior with Vincent Price. Mm -hmm. um, and then I told you what he said about it. Already. He, yeah. he hated that movie and wanted to do a remake. Uh, Anthony Zerb plays Matthias. I think it's yeah. Zerb or Zerbe. I, I think he's a great character actor from the 70s and 80s. Uh, he's still around, I think. Uh, Charlton Heston actually had a hand in getting him cast after seeing him perform in uh, local theater productions. Awesome. Yeah. I didn't I, know he came from theater. So that's I great. didn't either. I thought that was fun. Um, they. All right. Then we're going to move on to Lisa. Lisa was originally supposed to be or they wanted Diane Carroll to play the of part. You know, but Diane Carroll was beautiful and very, uh, I guess much more popular at the time. She was already doing more high profile projects. Whereas Rosalind Cash, who did play the part, kind of came out of the the black exploitation movement with um, Pam Greer, if I'm not mistaken. Now, if I'm speaking out of turn, somebody can yell at me online or, or in a comment, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they came around the same time in the 70s. I think Diane Carroll came from the 60s. Does yes. that make sense? Yep. If not, maybe it was maybe they were from the late 60s because this was 71. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, Judy Pace was also considered for the role. I did not know who she was. Did you? No. Well, she was in Frogs with Ray Milan. Oh, well, a classic. I'd <laughs> yes. watched that before. This. Driving so the, classic. Yep. I think it's on our list. It may be. 
It should um, be. Oh, you know what? I have here that Rosalind Cash was in Clute. Which would have been a high profile 60s movie, late 60s, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Jane Fonda. Was that late 60s or 70s? I can't remember. I think that was, I thought that was late 60s. Yeah. So she she was probably a prostitute in that with Jane Fonda, who played a prostitute in that, is what I'm thinking. Um, And she was also in Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai, which may or may not be a movie we cover sometime in the near future. Definitely (laughs) should be. Um, She was uneasy about her love scene with Charlton Heston. So um, her exact words were, it feels strange to screw Moses. (laughs) Of course. course Because Charlton Heston was known for playing Moses in the Ten Commandments, as well as the chariot guy and Ben-Hur. He came from religious films, kind of. Yeah. Whoopi Goldberg has remarked that the kiss between the characters played by Charlton Heston and Rosalind Kiss, uh, Rosalind Cash, was one of the first interracial kisses to appear in a movie. So when you were researching, that was probably one of the ones you came across. Yes. As true. somebody saying that, apparently it influenced Whoopi, who was a child at the time. Um, Charlton said that his co-star Rosalind Cash had difficulties in acting with him. He then tried to talk to her very quietly and confessed that he also had difficulties in playing (laughs) Ben-Hur. He's such an egomaniac, man. He's he's such a turd. I mean, I did think they had good chemistry. They obviously... I I thought they were fine. ...worked together well on camera. I think it's also that they're both decent actors. They just happen to be on a pretty bad movie. Yeah. Um, and then I really have nothing else. Paul Coslo played Dutch. Eric Lenouville played Richie, who, like I said, went on to be a, a TV director of movies and things that we actually like now. Oh, yeah. Um, and then Lincoln Kilpatrick played Zachary, who I believe is in the picture behind me. Okay. Um, the. I have a few other. Tr- oh, no. You know, I always usually do awards. I meant to say there were no awards for last. <laughs> so I didn't. And it's not on the 1001 movies you must see before you die. Right. Nor is this one. Um, however, the NAACP Image Awards did nominate Rosalind Cash for Outstanding Actress in a Motion Picture, which to me is sad and happy at the same time because. Agreed. I mean, it, she she should be nominated because she's a great actress, but she's nominated probably because she was the only black actress in somewhat of a leading role that year that we know of, or, or I doubt there were that many at the time. Yeah, and so that wasn't a black exploitation sort of thing, yes. right? Agreed. Right, exactly. And um, so you know, we've come a long way, folks. So that's really all the awards I have. I have a little bit of trivia before we move on to keys. Uh, yes. The production company wanted a locale that looked like an abandoned metropolitan area, but it was too costly to build. Uh, They drove through Los Angeles one weekend and discovered there were no shoppers on weekends. So they just kind of went in and shot on weekends. And that's the business district. They shot downtown in the business district because, of course, there's no work going on on the weekends. You know, that's very funny. When I lived in D.C., it was the same way. The business district was always dead on Saturday and Sunday. And that was in the 90s. Yeah. It's the same um, thing. I mean, Atlanta's the same way downtown. Right. You know, on Saturday yeah, and Sunday. Yeah, you saw cars in the background. <laughs> yeah, and stoplights working and everything else. Yeah. <laughs> I also had an issue because he goes to do this Woodstock thing or watch his movie, which evidently he does you know, periodically. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that would be impossible with the technology that he has because he goes up and he turns the projector on and then goes to sit down. But at that time in the late 60s, early 70s, projection reels are only uh, 14 minutes long. So right. he would have to get up and change and reels. change the reel. It's, and it's also, not, there it's not have to be in electricity. Your VCR. Yeah. I mean, there is no electricity. Well, evident, I got the impression when they were showing that scene where he was turning on the projector that he had set up his own generator there. Mm. That was kind of the gag, I thought. Uh, and I could believe that, but he'd have to sit in the projection booth and watch it because he'd have to change reels. Yeah. So that's just the technical side of it that bugs me when I watch these with the red. Well, no, I thought of it, too. I was like, everything about that to me was impossible. Um, yes. Yeah. So I just let, you know, I let it flow over me. <laughs> Art. Yes. <clears throat> yep. Uh, trivia, trivia, trivia. Um, there are, well, Tim Burton 
has said this is his, one of his favorite films. So yes. I'm not alone in liking this movie. Um, he said he actually that he said, I think he, this would be one he would take on a desert island. Yes, he yeah. did. He did. Uh, of course, he later worked with Heston on his own remake of Planet of the Apes. Uh, there were some scenes that were deleted prior to the theatrical release of the film. One is when Lisa visits the grave of her parents and hears crying coming from a nearby crypt. Entering the crypt, she finds a female member of the family holding her stillborn baby. Armed with a machine gun, Lisa considers killing the mother, but turns and leaves instead. Mm -hmm. So there's some violence they avoided. Yeah. Uh, in another deleted scene immediately following, she tells Neville about the incident whereupon he asked if she took care of her. Lisa tells him she couldn't and reveals that she is pregnant with his child. Yeah. So that happened fast. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they're, they're bumping uglies, you know, within 24 hours and all of a sudden she's pregnant. <laughs> she was very receptive. It's that kind of time. Yeah. I actually have a trivia that uh, the composer, even though, uh, you know, we both say we do not like the music in this movie, huh. the composer is very popular because he also wrote the theme to Doctor Who. I thought you were going to say Shivaga. Nope. To Doctor Who. So that whole theme that we're all used to, that are all of us are Whovians, uh, uh, he wrote that. So, hey, he's making residuals for the past 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, and then lastly, I have one last deleted scene that featured a little girl who brings flowers and apples in a bag to Neville's apartment and prays for him to protect her and not let the devil take her soul. Right. <laughs> That's a, out of left field. I, do, uh, I don't even know where that would come in unless it's one of the little girls from the, the group of survivors or something. I don't know. So I have uh, I have two more quibbles before keys. One sure. is uh, uh, one of the big Matthias lines is, you know, destroying society. And we're going to you're the society. You're the night demon. You're the nightmare. All that kind of stuff. And he keeps judging him by saying he was the user of the wheel. He's one of those that used the wheel. And I was going, OK, well, the catapult you just pushed out has freaking wheels on it. And so does the cart that you're carrying him and his Ku Klux Klan Dumbo hat on or whatever. That has wheels on it, too. You can't say you don't like wheels and then have wheels. It just doesn't work for me. Uh, and how do they get in at the end? They, they, they're they marching, and they find Lisa. And I think Lisa lets them in. I think that's how, how does Lisa know how to even get in? We didn't show that anywhere. Oh, no, you're right, because really it had all taken place in like a day or two. I mean, it right. wasn't very long. Uh, so Probably in the novel, it's a couple of weeks or months or something, right? I mean, uh, well, in the novel, this does not happen. <laughs> oh, well, then there's that. Okay. Um, now, in the novel, the, the woman that he comes across is a part of a new race of like beings that have the virus, but are still somewhat human. Um, and, and, and I don't remember if they need blood to survive or not. Mm, okay. And um, she is trying to protect him from the ones that want to kill him in the, the new novel. society. Yeah. Right. And he does end up dying in the novel, but not in a Jesus Christ pose that I recall. I, and I had a question right before keys. I had a question of, do you, is there another film that you can think of, which totally changes the impetus of the, of, I mean, I mean sure there are, but uh, it totally changed the impetus of the novel, like the core, like, like in the novel, like you said, he, the big, twist at the end the Mathesonism is he realizes he is extinct he is the last uh, uh man on uh, earth he's the last man on earth he's the last person from that society and and everybody else is going to continue to evolve this is the new species of humanity and he's a legend kind of thing right. but in all of these movie adaptations even the will smith one he's the savior of humanity he is his blood is going to restore life kind of thing uh even though in last man he's killed and you don't get it in this one you definitely get it. in will smith you get it they he gives it to the survivor although that guy catches it very carefully i mean not carefully at all i'm like you're gonna drop that thing and break it <laughs> yeah but he catches it yeah you know, he's got the kool-aid so he, he's got he's, the kool-aid yeah, it looks like kool-aid too yeah 
Um, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Are there other, is there any other you can think of where they dr- so drastically change the core theme of the or the story of the the thing? You know, I, I mean, I was trying to think of one just so I could mention it, but I couldn't right off. You're talking about for a key? No, just as a, before we jump to keys. So, so they've the 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 fictionalization of the novel changes the real purpose of the freaking novel. You know what I mean? Oh uh, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm I mean, sure there, there's there always differences, but you're talking about the core. Yeah, I mean, um, the big revelation in this is that he is not the savior of humanity. As a matter of fact, he's not going to do anything for humanity at all. And what in about all Dune? of the adaptations, he is. What about the the David Lynch version of Dune? Did that change drastically from the novel? I don't know. Not the thematics. The, the no. basics are there. It's just that he picked bad scenes and bad actors to to try to do that in yeah. Lynch's one. Yeah, I, I mean, you're right. Everything changes in this one. That's why, you know, Richard Matheson was like, I don't care because it's so different from my book. It's its own little thing. So Right. Right. So yeah. he said, you know, you're not even close to what I wanted to do with this story. Right. <laughs> you know? um, and, and all honesty, and I didn't touch on this and I, I won't touch on it too heavy, but I, I have mentioned before that when Richard Matheson was young and writing this and in The Incredible Shrinking Man, which we covered last week. Yeah. He was very full of testosterone. I mean, he's always talking about the women and their breasts and observations. And in, in, I am legend. One of the big things is, you know, the fact that he is not getting laid and these female vampires are really tempting to him. I mean, he he could almost be persuaded because he's that horny. And I'm like, wait a minute. Right. Mm. Yeah, sure. Don't you have like some lube and some a hand, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> Don't go outside. <laughs> but anyway, I think Charlton Heston plays that up too a little bit. Oh, yeah. Right. Vincent Price doesn't, but you can see it in Heston. Like when he looks at that calendar and it's got that girl and that it's like a Playboy calendar. It's got the girl in the oh, swimsuit. Yeah. You yeah. can see it in his eyes. Yeah. You know, I'm like, okay, that's a little bit of Robert Neville right there. Yeah. So. Yeah, I could see that. And and that was Madison. I, I'm surprised he wasn't hanging out with Roddenberry, you know. But maybe. I mean, well, he was. I mean, because he wrote an episode of Star Trek and, well, and yeah. he was hanging out with all those other California writers at the time, Bradbury and Ellison. Sturgeon and Nolan yeah. and all of them. Yeah. Um, anyway, I digress. We got keys. 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 My first key is Evil Knievel because he takes that motorcycle right over that car. You know what? That I was going to say Fonzie, but <laughs> <laughs> talk about jumping the shark. Yeah, yeah there you go. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, that one worked Can for evil. me too. That's so funny. I didn't think about him. Well, you know, that was a very 70s thing. He's going to jump the Grand Canyon. He's going to, you know, he's a big Vegas jump. I don't, and Fonzie trucks. didn't just jump the shark. I think he jumped something on land before they did the ocean one, didn't he? Didn't jump a bunch yeah, of trash was, cans or something. Yeah. 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 Um, my big key to this, it kind of ties into the, the, the first movie is a huge key to night of the living dead. To me, this is a big key to dawn of the dead. I mean, yeah, think about the urbanization. And it, the, it's the, very urban. He's driving through a city with dead bodies everywhere. Um, there's prominent black actors in it with afros because it was roughly both movies were made in the 70s so i mean there's just and and the bright paint colored blood yeah. <laughs> you know I mean, there's just yeah. a lot of things about this movie that remind me of dawn of the dead yeah the, the same way the other reminds me of uh night of the living dead could so, have could have yeah <clears throat> uh, i've I mentioned got, uh, well, you're, go ahead. You're well, I was going to say, I mentioned The Stand because I did that little tie-in earlier yeah. on, but there's actually a, a prequel to The Stand in Stephen King's Night Shift, and it's a story called Night Surf, where these survivors of an apocalypse are on the beach, and that reminds me of this as well. It's, it's a post-apocalypse wow. story. Okay. Well. I didn't so, know that. That's yeah. interesting. Mm-hmm. I've got... Um, in my notes, I found out that all of her dialogue, especially in the first scene that she was in, was put in there because of the Black Panther movement. So a key to her character development and her dialogue especially was the Black Panther movement. They wanted to you know, recognize that 
and make it hip or whatever. Uh, very shaft like dialogue. And I've got shaft as an influence too. that whole kind of music, uh, the way she's wearing the leather in her first scene and everything is very shaft. It's very, I, and I hate to connect it. I mean, I, I, there's nothing wrong with black exploitation. I, I appreciate those films. I like actually going back and watching Blackula or yeah. you know, Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde or whatever. Um, I hate that, uh, that, I, I, quality actors of that era get lumped in there though. And that kind of does that a little bit to me. Um, I guess they were doing it to give her more representation, but the representation they gave her is kind of cliche. If that makes yes. sense. Agreed. Agreed. So um, I've got Michael Jackson because that was Richie. Richie was, was not <laughs> totally Michael Jackson yet, but he was getting there. Uh, he does have a big afro like Michael Jackson, yep. but I and think he's Michael getting actually, paler. He's getting paler. You I think know, Michael kind of was actually a slightly better actor, though. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> definitely, definitely, because <laughs> he was in Ben, wasn't he? Oh yeah, yeah, he sang the song. Ben. He sang the song. He was yeah, there. that's right. Um, um, I've got the passage, which is actually ooh, a yeah. key to the book itself because mm -hmm. it is a scientific apocalyptic novel about vampirism that was written about 10 or 15 years ago by justin cronin they made a failed attempt at a series with it that sucks because it's such a great book and yeah. it ended up being a trilogy so but yeah, the and it was uh, definitely yeah in. and it was like this it was a bioweapon too it wasn't just a oh it got a virus got away right it was right a, it they was were weaponizing. It they were weaponizing it and yeah. it got out yeah. Yeah, yeah very much like the stand yeah i've got this becomes of course part of the Hes what i call the heston trilogy which is started with planet of the apes then omega and then soylent green i That's think i put big science soylent fiction. green in there but um soylent green and this is very similar, in, even down to him wearing the khaki safari thing. Very similar to the television style that Soylent Green was filmed into. Oh, I thought you were going to say Naked Jungle. Ants. Yeah. <laughs> well, ants. Yeah, ants. They are going to eat you. They're going to eat you. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, and another... I haven't seen Soylent Green in a long time. Is it any good or am I going to watch it and it be like this? <laughs> No, it's much more thematic than this. They've got much more science fiction uh, cred. It's been a, so long since I saw that movie. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think it. they, it's on our I, list. I think they really lose it in the last like fifteen minutes with the end of this end of the movie. But uh, up until then, it's really cool society, a good world building, uh, great storyline, uh, sad uh, dystopian look at what we could possibly be, sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I've got another Heston one beneath the Planet of the Apes because uh, I take, had that. <laughs> yep, when they take the makeup off, I'm thinking, okay, those are the mutants. They just need to, you know, they have hair. This well, and is, it's like a weird cult too. Yeah, oh yeah, they, and they just the are underground and they worship the bomb. And yep. I was like, yes, there are direct ties to Beneath the Planet of the Apes in this. definitely another Heston definitely. movie. And well, Heston is only in a little bit of it. They yep. recast him with James Franciscus, I think. Yes. Uh, well, actually, he's a, isn't he the one that takes over in the third one? I can't no, remember. No, he's the hero in that. Heston only comes in at the end. Heston comes in at the end with Nova, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. And, and, Correct. Because that's who he's looking for, for. James Franciscus is like the astronaut that goes looking for Heston. Or Correct. Something. Yeah. <laughs> and has to go through the exact same thing of culture shock and yada, yada, but then goes underground and finds New York and everything else. Yeah. Right. Right, the subways and the mutants, yes, yeah. and the bomb, the bomb, the whole the bomb. bomb. Um, I have Soundgarden, the music, the 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 rock band Soundgarden from yeah. Seattle, you know, grunge and everything. Yeah, uh, they have a po a song I love called Jesus Christ Pose. There you go. <laughs> and and if that isn't a Jesus Christ pose behind me right now, <laughs> I don't is, know what is. <laughs> that's the Jesus Christ pose. I mean, come on, let's just say it. Yeah, it is uh, the, the Charlton Heston interpretation of it anyway. Um, everything else I have is off. I lift it off IMDb, I believe. Because, uh, I, I mean, it's a very influential novel, obviously. So a lot of these keys are going to overlap. 
Well, so. we talk about influences, everything and past influence or post influences too. I have that this directly influenced Mystery Science Theater 3000. I, that was one of the ones I had that I lifted. Yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd seen that somewhere and they had said that uh, Joel or whoever, the guy who created it, right. actually, you know, the Woodstock scene is what inspired him to to do that entire series. So that's because definitely- he's talking over the, the movie, over the movie and talking yeah. to it. And everything. Yep. That's interesting. I would have thought it would have been more. I really want to make fun of the Omega Man and talk over it. Right. <laughs> See, that would be fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, another one I lifted from IMDb is exactly what you said earlier about the interracial kiss. Um, yep. It was still considered controversial in the 70s, but they figured that in a world where humanity had become almost extinct, that we would no longer care about such issues. Um, and yeah, you know, they referenced the Kirk Uhura kiss back in 66 or 67, whenever 67. that was. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then lastly, I've got something I don't know anything about, but it is uh, the opening credits use a font called Ravenscroft. I've never, I'm not sure what that font is. Okay. It's, it's apparently named from someone named Thurl Ravenscroft, and it's used for the sign of the Haunted Mansion. It, at disneyland there you go <laughs> i thought that was kind of cool that's a cool um, key I, I guess you would have to to buy that font because i don't see that usually in my list of fonts on word documents or whatever um and that i think is about it <laughs> you got my austin powers right because i mean he is wearing an austin powers i mean it's the, the sh- suit it's a different color but it's the same tailor everything the velvet. All you that. mean when he has a shirt on? Because two of the, the pictures I have behind me, he's not wearing a shirt at all. No, when he dresses for dinner. Remember, he says, is it Sunday? I always dress for dinner on Sundays. Uh, and then he comes right. out and he has all the ruffles with the crush velour velvety jacket and oh pants. My God. And <laughs> like, yeah, baby. Yeah, come on. I do like how he always plays chess with the bust of like Julius Caesar, Caesar. with like a cap on him. Yep. Yeah, that's yep. kind of fun. And it's his cap. It's his uh, um, uh, his Air Force cap. It looks yeah. like. Yeah. Well, neither one of these movies were uh, esteemed enough to go into the 1001 movies you must see before you die. Of course but not. I like them both. I would watch them both again. I would probably watch the Omega Man, though, before I would watch The Last Man on Earth, even though The Last Man on Earth is technically a more faithful adaptation of the novel. <laughs> I would concur with you, actually. Um, <laughs> it's just more fun to watch. It's, it's you know, it's, it is. It's, it's, not- it's, it's hilarious in ways that are not necessarily intentional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that's what Tim and I think. We want to know what you guys think out there. So let us know. Uh, give us a comment down below. Did you like either of these movies? Are we just totally off base in saying, you know, uh, why aren't they more faithful adaptations? Or are you a Will Smith fan and you think this that's the best version ever or whatever? Like, I would have to fight you on iRobot about that because that's a terrible movie. too. I've heard anyway. they're doing a sequel to I Am Legend, his version, but who knows? Well, he died at the end of the first one, so it'll be interesting to see how they do that. Uh, But maybe it's a prequel, as they say. Um, And also, as we said at the beginning, please uh, consider giving us a review. Please subscribe. Ring the bell down there. Um, We also have a website. It has all of our past episodes. We are into our sixth season now. We're so happy that we're able to still do that. And we also always beg and plead and ask you to consider becoming a patron in Patreon. Uh, You know, only a dollar a month or so helps us keep the website going and everything else. And we'd appreciate that. Um, And you can also, uh, as a Patreon tier, you can hear two of our other podcasts that we have. Uh, One is the Dilithium Chamber, where we do a deep dive into Star Trek, the original series. And the other one is um, uh, the X-Files Declassified, which talks about all the spooky and scientific things in X-Files. Um, Tim, next week, we're going to go where? Where are we going to be? What are we going to uh, do? We might be doing another Richard Matheson movie. What? <laughs> it's like a month of Matheson. <laughs> it is. You know, that, that's what it is. Uh, August, September is the month of Matheson. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, so if you like Richard Matheson and don't know what we're going to do, we're going to do it next week. So come back and, and listen to it. It is sci-fi. 
it is more so fun. than horror. Yeah. Um, however, this was kind of a hybrid. Yeah. I, so. Actually, I guess last week it was kind of a hybrid too. It, it was, was sci-fi horror, incredible shrieking man. This was last man on earth or, or I am legend. And then next week, well, you just have to, to see my little preview on Thursday or, uh, Join Patreon and I'll send you the list. <laughs> there you go. You get to see the list and you get to pick on, on Patreon too. And let us know what. Yeah. You yeah. We're doing listener episodes. So. All right. There you go. Tim. See you next time. Buddy. All right. You have a good one. Bye. Bye. Start the car, Johnny has the keys.